whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. Queen Elizabeth II has been the reigning monarch of the United Kingdom and the Commonwealth since 1952. Much like the nation she resides over, she has seen unimaginable growth and change in her time. Throughout it all, she has had the love and support of one man, Prince Philip, always by her side. Together, their royal highnesses have kept in the most famous family in the world through hardship and reinvention. Their enduring love and unbreakable bond has been a staple of modern history. I think that the main lesson that we've learned is that tolerance is the one essential ingredient of any happy marriage. And uh, you can take it from me that the Queen has the quality of tolerance and abundance. <laughs> All too often, I fear Prince Philip has had to listen to me speaking. He is someone who doesn't take easily to compliments, but he has quite simply been my strength and stay all these years. And I and his whole family owe him a debt greater than he would ever claim, or we shall ever know. Join us as we look back on their incredible lives together. This is Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip. Love, marriage, and country. In 1926, Britain was a much different place, almost unrecognizable in fact. King George V was on the throne, and Britain was still recovering from the horrors of the Great War, World War I. However, on a very dull and ordinary rainy day, April 21, 1926, the future Queen was born, Elizabeth Alexandra Mary. Princess Elizabeth had a very, very happy childhood. She was born in 1926 in the center of London, in Bruton Street, and it was six weeks before the general strike, so it was a time of great political turbulence. But there was still great excitement about this new royal baby. People were really interested in the royal family, although they never thought that she would be an heir to the throne, because at the time, everyone loved the Prince of Wales, uh, who, of course, was the later the Duke of Windsor who abdicated, but all eyes were on him. But this was a beautiful baby, and she was brought up by um, a series of nannies and nursemaids, and she had very loving parents, and they, they, they basically, in those days, people followed the sporting calendar. The winters were in hunting country, summers were in Scotland, and the season was in London. And Elizabeth had this idyllic childhood with her parents and horses and dogs, and also her loving grandparents. Princess Elizabeth has always loved animals. Uh, she was given a pony for her fourth birthday, but way before that, she loved her grandfather, King George V's parrot, Charlotte, who used to walk up and down the dining room table but she was allowed to give Charlotte sugar lumps. And he also had some dogs that she loved. And her mother and father had dogs, so she's always been around animals, but horses became her favorite. Princess Margaret was born in 1930, and Elizabeth looked after her. She was always really kind to her little sister, a beautiful little sister. And they had a very, very close relationship. They looked after each other, but obviously Elizabeth was the eldest. And so she kind of took charge of her little sister. But they were dressed identically. 
She was four years older, and yet she, they were wearing the same clothes, but that's how royal families dressed in those days. The outbreak of, of World War II affected the British royal family hugely because they were right up there at Buckingham Palace, which was a big, big target for the German bombers. But they decided that they would not leave the country, they would stay there with their people, but they obviously had to look after their two daughters. Elizabeth and Margaret started in Scotland, then they were uh, sent down south and they eventually stayed at Windsor Castle for five years while well, the king and queen went to London during the week and they wanted to be visible to their people. So they would go around the bombed areas, um, you know, and meet the people. And obviously the king became very involved with the troops and he would go and visit the troops. So they were a very big part of the PR war effort. Of the 500 German planes that came over that day, more than one third were shot down. In the 28 days of terror from September 7th to October 5th, the Nazis dropped 50 million pounds of bombs on the city, killed 7,000 helpless civilians, and wounded 10,000 more. Bombs fell on Buckingham Palace. Westminster Abbey. The Houses of Parliament. Fleet Street, the center of the news. St. Paul's Cathedral. Bombs blasting the historic past out of the lives of Englishmen. Once again, Londoners who have known nights of terror before return to their bombed out homes. But the damage here cannot compare with devastated Berlin, where one third of the city lies in ruins. Britain's beloved monarchs are on the scene a short while after, again demonstrating a human sympathy for their subjects, whose courage has never yet been shaken. But king, queen, or humble citizen, all veterans of the Blitz, demonstrate once more that London can still take it. I think that living five years of your childhood somewhere would give you either a loathing or a deep affection for a place. And I think that is definitely where the Queen sort of fell in love with Windsor Castle, which is still supposedly to be her favorite official home. In October 1940, the King and Queen paid a visit to the BBC and the chairman of the BBC asked them if there was any chance that perhaps his eldest daughter might contribute to the evacuees who were in Canada, Australia, um, North America. Um, there were a lot of them there. And they had a program called Children's Hour, which was embryonic then. And they asked the king if he would consider allowing his daughter to do it. Well, of course, she was thrilled to do it and practiced very, very hard. And eventually, age uh, only 14, gave this extremely professional speech to the children that were separated from their parents and told them, you know, that our men were fighting very hard and they would soon be reunited. And it was very, very professionally done. And then, because Princess Elizabeth was always thinking about her younger sister, she brought her younger sister in at the very end and said, come on, Margaret. And Come On, Margaret became a catchphrase in America. My sister is by my side, and we are both going to say good night to you. Come on, Margaret. Good night, children. Good night, and good luck to you all. The speech went down an absolute storm in America. It was like headline news in the New York Post that this princess had given this speech to the evacuees. And also politically, it was a very good thing because of course Churchill was trying to get uh, the president, Roosevelt, you know, to support us. So anything that we could do was a good thing. Hitler knows that he will have to break us in this island or lose the war. Let us therefore brace ourselves to our duty. And so bear ourselves that if the British Empire 
and its commonwealth last for a thousand years, men will still say, this was their finest hour. Elizabeth and Philip were first introduced to one another when Elizabeth was just eight years old. According to eyewitnesses, it was at the wedding of Princess Marina of Greece and Denmark, Philip's cousin, and Prince George, Duke of Kent, Elizabeth's uncle, in 1934. It wasn't until five years later, when Elizabeth was 13 and Philip was 18, that the two met again at the Royal Naval College in Dartmouth. This time, Elizabeth fell in love with the man who would become her future husband. Princess Elizabeth met Prince Philip at a family wedding, but she can't really remember that moment. The reason we know so much about it is because her governess, Marion Crawford, uh, talks in great detail about their first meeting at Dartmouth College, where Prince Philip was a, a naval cadet. And he was very, very good looking, 18 years old, very striking, blonde looking and he was assigned to look after the two princesses, Elizabeth and Margaret, for the day, for their visit, while their parents went around the college. I mean, it was quite strange to think of an 18-year-old looking after the princesses, the oldest of whom was 13, but he decided that it would be fun if they jumped the tennis nets. So he took the princesses outside and he jumped the tennis nets for them, and they were very, very impressed. Later, he went on board the vessel that the, the, the king and queen had come to Dartmouth in, and he had lunch, and then, and then the following day he went and had tea. So that was the meeting that the princess remembers. Prince Philip of Greece and Denmark was born in Monrepos on the Greek island of Corfu on June 10, 1921. The only son and fifth and final child of Prince Andrew of Greece and Denmark and Princess Alice of Battenberg. After a suffocating loss during the Greco-Turkish War, a revolutionary court banished Philip's father from Greece for life, and he evacuated the country with his family aboard HMS Calypso. It was a difficult and strenuous upbringing, fraught with tragedy, moving from place to place. Prince Philip was born on the Greek island of Corfu. His father was in the Greek army, and eventually the family were exiled from Greece and went to live in Paris, where Prince Philip was sent to school. Then his mother, who was mentally very fragile, went into a sanatorium, and it was decided that it would be better for Philip to be educated by his cousins in England. So he was sent to school in England and lived with his cousins, the Martian, Marchioness of Milford Haven. And then he eventually was sent to Gordonston. But all this made him very independent and very strong. And I, he never says, he always maintains he didn't have an unhappy childhood. It was probably a very interesting childhood because he, he traveled from a very, very early age and also they were a very grand family. They were princes of Greece and Denmark. So they were related to both sides. And they were actually also related to all the houses of Europe. So they had a lot of very influential relations. And when there wasn't any money, their relations paid for them, as, as was the way it went in those days. His mother was Queen Victoria's great-granddaughter, and his mother was born in Windsor Castle, actually. And his mother was also Lord Louis Mountbatten's sister. She was, she was stone deaf. So uh, as, a, as a young boy, Prince Philip learnt sign language. But he understood his mother. And also, they were, they were so international, the family, that they spoke, they spoke in 
French, they spoke in German, and they spoke in English. They didn't really speak in Greek, but they did, did speak all the other European languages. They thought that being educated in uh, England with his cousins would be more stable for him. And also, if you think about it, you know, it was the outbreak of Nazi Germany. And they thought it would be better for Philip to be out of Europe and, and in England. It would be safer for him. Prince Philip fulfilled his military service in, in the Royal Navy. Um, he was, ed he was uh, educated uh, at Dartmouth College, and then he left college and went straight into the Navy, and he actually saw action, and he saw the Japanese surrender um, at the Battle of Matapan. Philip finally found stability in the Royal Navy in 1939, when he became a cadet at the Royal Naval College Dartmouth, the very place he would meet his future bride, Elizabeth. Elizabeth was just 21 when their engagement was announced on July 9, 1947. The engagement was not without controversy. Philip had no financial standing, was foreign-born, and had sisters who had married German noblemen with Nazi links. Before the marriage, Philip renounced his Greek and Danish titles, officially converted from Greek Orthodoxy to Anglicanism, and adopted the style Lieutenant Philip Mountbatten taking the surname of his mother's British family. Just before the wedding, he was created Duke of Edinburgh and granted the style His Royal Highness. When her engagement to Lieutenant Philip Mountbatten of the Royal Navy is announced, the heart of the world is thrilled by the prospect of one royal wedding with a genuine aura of romance. A former Greek prince, Philip gave up his Greek citizenship to become a British subject. On the eve of the wedding, the king elevates him to the peerage, and he becomes officially His Royal Highness Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, Earl of Marionette and Baron Greenwich. From all over Christendom, gorgeous and regal gifts pour into Buckingham Palace. Among them, lovely crystal pieces including a delicately chased crystal bowl from the President of the United States. From Prince and Commoner, tokens of esteem and good wishes by the hundreds are acknowledged individually by Elizabeth with the simple sincerity of any well-bred young woman who punctiliously observes the amenities despite the tremendous demands upon her time. This picnic camper from Sister Margaret is covered with alligator skin. The Swiss watchmakers send one of their finest. From Burma and Bombay to Regent Street in London, jewels from governments and family have been showered on the bride. Well, when uh, Elizabeth and Philip got engaged, they decided that because London was ravaged by war and you know, a, a lot of the buildings were absolutely rubble and, and there was, you know, there was unemployment, there was rationing, it was in a really bad place. The king thought, well, let's have a very quiet wedding at St George's Chapel, Windsor. No point, no ceremony, we'll just be very private. But then the government surprisingly said, no, 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 we need to lift the people's spirits. Let's have a beautiful royal wedding that everybody can see. So that is what ended up happening. And, and it was televised and eventually the, the television got to America. So it, was, it became a global affair and it did lift people's spirits in London hugely. To see this beautiful young couple married, uh, uh, you know, no one had seen anything like that for, for the years of the war. Elizabeth and Philip were married on the 20th of November 1947 at Westminster Abbey. They received 2,500 wedding gifts from around the world. Because Britain had not yet completely recovered from the devastation of the war, Elizabeth required ration coupons to buy the material for her gown, which was designed by Norman Hartnell. In post-war Britain, it was not acceptable for Philip's German relations 
including his three surviving sisters to be invited to the wedding. And now the great hour arrives as the Queen and Princess Margaret Rose leave Buckingham Palace for the ceremony at Westminster Abbey. And Prince Philip, with split-second timing, also departs for the great rendezvous. The royal standard waves over a truly royal occasion as the state coach with Elizabeth and the King is escorted to Westminster Abbey by the household of cavalry guards, a sovereign's escort. Pomp, pageantry and splendor are revived for this day in austerity-ridden London, a day which the world shares with Britain. This is the moment for which the teeming millions have been waiting for months. swells in volume as cheering thousands greet the princess. The drabness of the day is forgotten. Here at Westminster Abbey, scene of splendor on great occasions through its 900 years of British history, the royal coach arrives at the great west door through whose portals the mighty of old England have passed. It is a radiant bride-to-be, the loveliest the old abbey has ever looked upon. Here at Britain's historic shrine, where all the kings have been crowned, Her Royal Highness, the Princess Elizabeth Alexandra Mary, and His Royal Highness, Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, are wed in the same ceremony that has united English couples from village to palace for centuries. Here they plight their troth. Georgina. In the proud words of King George, our daughter has married the man she loves. Elizabeth and Philip take their places on history's pages. To the stirring strains of Mendelssohn, they march as man and wife toward the west door amidst nearly 3,000 invited spectators. It is a deeply moving occasion, and yet a supremely happy one for the king and queen as well as the queen mother. The Duke and Duchess of Gloucester and Duchess of Kent are followed by the royal couple of Holland. In England, the man doesn't take the wife's title. The woman takes the husband. So when Princess Elizabeth became queen, he didn't become king because that was her title and it, it, it didn't pass to him. But conversely, when uh, the queen mother became queen, she took her husband's title. So she was married to King George VI and she was Queen Elizabeth because she took his title. But it doesn't work the other way round. Well, from Prince Philip's perspective, this is someone that had had to leave their country. They didn't have a home of their own. All his sisters were married to German aristocracy and lived in enormous castles. And there's Philip, you know, living off the goodwill of his relations, so I think that the idea of, of marrying a princess that, that was going to inherit so much must have been very attractive. And he was pushed by his uncle, Louis Mountbatten, who was the great kingmaker. And he really pushed Philip it, 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 into kind of um, maintaining a relationship with Princess Elizabeth. She was completely smitten with him from the age of 13. And I think she started right, she wrote to him to say, you know, thank you for entertaining us at Dartmouth. And I suppose she it gradually, gradually kept up. Then, of course, during, during the, the time when he was on leave, on shore leave, he, he often went to stay at Windsor Castle. And that's when their relationship, you know, became more serious. And eventually, eventually, he proposed to her at Balmoral.
Her Royal Highness is the proud and happy mother of a prince. The salute is fired, and in the monarch's home lies the infant boy who will one day be king. On Saturday, the eminent gynecologist Sir William Gilliatt was called to the palace for the most responsible case in even his career. By his advice, Sister H.M. Rowe was chosen midwife. The whole country knew that the baby would soon be born. All day on Sunday, people waited outside the palace, including phlegmatic pressmen, with whom it is a point of honor to show no excitement. And all day, there was no announcement. It was after 10 at night that those who waited, and they were very many, heard the tremendous news, a royal baby and a boy. Radio gave no advantage to watchers at the palace. The glad tidings went out everywhere. This is the BBC Home Service. It has been announced officially from Buckingham Palace during the past hour that Her Royal Highness, the Princess Elizabeth, Duchess of Edinburgh, was safely delivered of a prince at 9.14 p.m. today. And that Her Royal Highness and her son are both doing well. The press agencies were covering the world. The miracles of modern communication spanned the globe. Unto us a child is born. And no ordinary child, a prince. For the moment, all other news took second place. The morning newspapers went to press with one of those rare, warm stories that touch every heart. Cable and radio brought thousands of messages of congratulation from every corner of the Commonwealth. The young royal mother, herself a child but little more than yesterday, lay at her parents' home, an infant prince at her side. By custom, the Home Secretary was among the first informed. When he arrived at the Home Office next morning, the announcement hung outside. Mr. Tutor Eade was not called to the palace. No one feared in this day and age that some other child would be foisted on the nation. Privileged on this royal occasion to drive through Marble Arch into the park were a king's troop of Royal Horse Artillery. It was their honor and proud duty to fire the salute of 41 guns announcing the birth of a prince. Elizabeth gave birth to her first child, Prince Charles, on 14th of November, 1948. One month earlier, the king had issued letters patent allowing her children to use the style and title of a royal prince or princess, to which they otherwise would not have been entitled, as their father was no longer a royal prince. A second child, Princess Anne, was born in 1950. Prince Philip loves babies and small children, and he, had, um, he was so happy to, that his firstborn should be a son and heir. Um, but he wanted his son to be uh, an image of himself. He wanted him to be macho, and he wanted him to be sporty, and he wanted him to have a sort of very strong personality. Well, Charles wasn't like that at all. He was very timid. He wasn't particularly sporty. He, 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 you know, he was a little awkward, and he wasn't really the son that Philip hoped he'd have. So as Charles grew, their relationship was, just didn't work. Philip would, you know, sort of bark orders at, at Charles, and Charles would cringe and be timid. Um, they just didn't rub along well together. And then when it came to Charles's further education, Philip said, well, whatever, what was good enough for me would be good enough for Charles. And he actually thought that Gordonston would be good for Charles because it was up in the north of Scotland, away from the press. And it was, you know, it was meant to be wonderful outdoor life and, and, and you know, great emphasis was placed upon the training of the mind as well as the training of the brain. And Philip thought it would be perfect. I think the Queen and the Queen Mother probably thought that it, he would be, being such a sensitive young man, he probably would have been better to go to Eton, um, which was, you know, just across the bridge from Windsor and he would be nearer his family. But Philip overruled that uh, and he was sent to Gordonston. Yes, Prince Philip felt very aggrieved by the fact that he wasn't able to give his own children his surname. Now, Prince Philip's family name had been Battenberg, but it was changed because it was too Germanic. It was changed from Battenberg to Mount Batten, and Philip wanted Mount Batten as the family name. He wanted it to be the house of Mount Batten. And when the royal circles, I think, Queen Mary heard of this, she said, no way is this going to be the house of Mountbatten. 
Am I not having Louis Mountbatten, you know, attach his name to, to the royal, immediate royal family? So it became the House of Windsor. And uh, Philip was very, very hurt. So later on, um, it became Mountbatten Windsor so that he could also have his name included. And the first of his children, which uh, was when Princess Anne married, on the marital register, it does say Mountbatten Windsor. New joy has come to the royal family in the birth to Princess Elizabeth at Clarence House of a second son. But of course, the joy is not restricted to the royal family, and messages of congratulation from all over the world have been pouring into the princess's home ever since the news became known. The early years of marriage have set the seal on the happiness of the princess and her husband. The blessing of children has come not only to enrich their lives, but also to establish securely the line of succession. In Prince Charles, the public has acquired a new popular subject of interest, of whom some delightful pictures have been taken. We should like to see more of him, but the insatiable demand of the public has had to bow to the princess's very proper determination that her son shall not be spoilt by publicity. The public will be no less curious to see the first pictures of his brother, to compare the likenesses and note the differences. To Sir William Gilliard, the great gynaecologist, fell the medical responsibility of seeing the new prince safely into the world. The nurse was Miss Helen Rowe. Everything possible to ensure the safety and health of mother and son was naturally done, but there must always be anxiety. That is now over, and the nation's rejoicing is marked by a salute of guns. This is fired in Hyde Park by the Royal Horse Artillery in full dress. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. But I shall not have strength to carry out this resolution alone unless you join in it with me, as I now invite you to do. I know that your support will be unfailingly given God help me to make good my vow, and God bless all of you who are willing to share in it. Prince Philip was uh, stationed in Malta on board his, his ship, and so the Queen would visit him every few months, and Prince Charles, it was, it was their first child, was left behind, and then uh, the Queen was able to actually sort of, for the first time, and probably the only time in her life, be like any other housewife wasn't quite the same, but she was able to go shopping, she was able to have her hair done, she was able to drive around the island, and they all went to sort of like naval dances, and they just sort of joined in with the, the life of the other, other young naval officers and their wives. And, and it, for her, it was just a huge pleasure. And it, she, that's why she has such a fondness for Malta. Well, I think the reason that, that the Queen is referred to by some historians as un the unlikely Queen is that, you know, she wasn't prepared to be Queen. She was married in 1947, um, and she expected to have a proper long-ish married life before her father, you know, was died. But he died quite suddenly. So she was an unlikely queen. And also she wasn't designated to be queen because her uncle, uh, who became Edward VIII very briefly, abdicated and put Elizabeth directly in the line of succession. During 1951, George VI's health declined and Elizabeth frequently stood in for him at public events. When she toured Canada and visited President Harry S. Truman in Washington, D.C., in October 1951, her private secretary, Martin Charteris, carried a draft accession declaration in case the king died while she was on tour. What happened was the 
Princess Elizabeth and Prince Philip were standing in for the King and Queen and they started a, a, a big Commonwealth tour in, in Kenya, as it was called in those days. And the people of Kenya wanted them to be there and they'd given them a lodge for their wedding present. And the, the sort of joy for them was that they were going to visit this game reserve and there was a, a little place called Treetops, which was overlooking a salt lake, lake. So you could really see the animals. You know, this is, this is uh, 1952. So the whole of, uh, of Kenya was teeming with game. And they spent the night up there. And actually it was during the night, unbeknownst to the princess that she became queen. So they went, they, they left their, their game viewing, went back to Sagana Lodge and had, had a little sleep because they'd been up all night. When the news came across to Prince Philip's uh, private secretary, Mike Parker, that the king had died and he thought that he, he, he eventually had, he had one of those little radios and he fiddled with it and eventually he heard the sounds of Big Ben and he knew that the news was true. And it was his duty to tell Prince Philip which was probably, he says, later the most difficult thing he'd ever had to do in his life. So he went to Prince Philip and told him the news that his wife, Prince Philip's wife, was queen. So Prince Philip was in such shock, he just put a newspaper over his face and let the news just absorb. And then he got up and he went and got the princess out of her bedroom where she was resting and took her down to the lake at the bottom of the garden and the lady in waiting tells a wonderful story she watched them walk up and down up and down and she knew that he was telling her and when they walked back into the lodge she wanted to, she was putting her arms around the princess and she thought my goodness but she's queen and dropped into a curtsy and then of course they had to make their way back to England as quickly as possible, but, she, but by the time they arrived back at London Airport, uh, she came down the steps, beautifully dressed in her black clothes, and Prince Philip waited on the steps until she was at the bottom and she greeted her Prime Minister. And that's how it was going to be from then on. Well, I think Prince Philip never envisaged that his young princess would become queen so quickly. They thought they had years ahead of them. So I think it was very difficult when suddenly his wife became queen. And, you know, he was demoted, if you like, to forever walk two steps behind. And he was treated very badly by the stuffy old courtiers at the palace. And you know, they, they thought he was an interloper, you know, he was far too German. And um, although he was a Greek prince, you know, he had a lot of German blood, so they just called him, you know, just thought he was German. And so it was very, very difficult for him. Princess Elizabeth became queen in February 1952, and the coronation was in June 1953. But there was no plan for her coronation. Uh, there had been a plan for her uncle's coronation, Edward VIII's, but that had been scuppered. So it, it takes a long time to pull all the ends together. So it was decided that they would wait and until June the following year, and then everything could be lined up, because for a coronation, you've got to have all the heads of state from all the various countries, all the Commonwealth. So you couldn't just say, well, we're going to have it in November. Everybody needed time to organize things. Well, the historical significance of the coronation is that it's a very ancient ceremony, and the queen, as she was by then, but she, she 
has to be anointed in the eyes of God, and that is the coronation ceremony. So she sits on the throne in a very simple white linen dress, and uh, she has holy oil put on her forehead, and that makes her queen in the eyes of God, which is why she always said in all her speeches, you know, I, I, I will rule and I will do my duty, and as long as I'm fit and able to do so. So um, it, it's an anointing ceremony in the eyes of God, and that was the great importance of it. And then, of course, you've got all the pomp and ceremony of all, all the lords and the ladies and the dignitaries and the heads of state. So it was an enormous undertaking, and it was televised because Prince Philip pushed the idea that it would be a great thing for the country and the Commonwealth and the world even uh, to have this, uh, this ancient ceremony televised. And it was, and it, it, it was taken back to America by, by plane. And I know the two big networks at the time, which was CBS and NBC, were in a sort of a race against each other to see who could get the film footage first. Um, so there was all kinds of, of things like that. Uh, and although the America got a little tiny snippet of the coronation, they didn't have the full ceremony, obviously. It had to be played out in cinemas in those days. Well, when, when the Queen came to the throne, she was only 26, and Churchill made the remark to his private secretary, but she's a child. But she wasn't a child. She was very sophisticated and mature mentally. And it was a man's world. And, in, you know, women were really subservient in those days. And the queen was walking into this world of men who were all much, much older than her. But, and also she hadn't really, it, you know, been taught. She said there was no way to be taught. All she did was she watched what her father did uh, and followed him. So, of course, the, the court was very old-fashioned and very stuffy, you know, because it was really her father's court. Well, Prince Philip had been in the Royal Navy. He was still in the Royal Navy when he, when he married, so he was used to routine and regulations of royal life. But what he wasn't used to was the way the courtiers treated him, because they saw him as a foreigner and an interloper and probably someone that wouldn't be faithful to his wife. So they didn't like him at all, and they made it very plain that they, they didn't like him. So he had a very, very difficult time. Very difficult indeed, and also, um, you know, he he was suddenly, um, um, he, you know, he, he eventually had to, be, you know, be two steps behind his wife. In the beginning, they had a very very happy marriage, very happy marriage. They they had Clarence House as their marital home, and they also had a, a country house which they rented in uh, at Windlesham Manor. So they had it all at the beginning, but it was for such a short time. I think the day-to-day -day life of the monarch is very regimented. I mean, she, she would be woken, that's about 7.30, she would have, her, her dresser would come in with a cup of tea and some biscuits for the dogs. You know, her clothes would be laid out, she would, be, she would dress, have breakfast, and then read, read the newspapers and listen to the radio, and then her day would start, and her private secretary would bring her important letters to look at and sign. And then every 20 minutes during the day, there is an appointment. So it, and it's the same every day during the working week. So it is a very regimented life. At this moment, my Silver Jubilee, I want to thank all those in Britain and the Commonwealth who through their loyalty and friendship have given me strength and encouragement during these last 25 years. My thanks go also to the many thousands who have sent me messages of congratulations on my Silver Jubilee. 
that and their good wishes for the future. My Lord Mayor, when I was 21, I pledged my life to the service of our people, and I asked for God's help to make good that vow. Although that vow was made in my salad days when I was green in judgment, I do not regret nor retract one word of it. Since Elizabeth rarely gives interviews, little is known of her personal feelings. As a constitutional monarch, she has not expressed her own political opinions in a public forum. She does have a deep sense of religious and civic duty, and takes her coronation oath seriously. Aside from her official religious role as Supreme Governor of the Established Church of England, she is a member of that church, and also of the National Church of Scotland. I think the characteristics that spring to mind to me are that she is stable, she's diligent, and she has an extraordinary ability to put duty before else, before everything. And that is, you know, a characteristic that really doesn't exist anymore. Um, but the Queen was probably the last person, you know, to, to decide that duty was everything. Duty became before personal happiness. Duty became before family and children. And um, that is the characteristic that defines her. And I think her stability um, also defines her. And the fact that we, she looks very somber, but then, you know, her face can crack into the most wonderful smile. And we learn over the years about her sense of humor and her ability with mimicry. Um, so we've got to know her, but very gradually. Well, 1992 was the worst year of the Queen's life. And she gave a speech at the Mansion House in London um, at the, towards the end of 92. And she said uh, she was going to refer to the year um, as an Annus Horribilis. And we all knew why, because it was, uh, there was the, her, her daughter, Princess Anne, uh, was separated, divorced, and remarried at the end of the year. Well, the remarriage was happy, but so her daughter's marriage had broken down. Um, Fergie and Andrew's marriage had broken down, but far the worst thing was the breakdown of the marriage of the Prince and Princess of Wales. And, the official announcement that they were going to split. And then on top of all that came the fire at Windsor Castle on the Queen's anniversary. A curtain caught on, upon a light in the chapel at Windsor Castle and it just blazed and the fire raced through all the state departments. It was a huge fire. Um, but lucky very, very few things were lost, but it was devastating and then the Prime Minister asked the country if they would be prepared to pay for the reconstruction of Windsor Castle, and basically the Queen's subject said no. I mean, although Windsor Castle is an official state building, not her own, uh, the, the general consensus was that we didn't want to pay for it. So then the Queen um, had to pay tax, and um, it just really wasn't a good year.
1992 is not a year on which I shall look back with undiluted pleasure. <clears throat> In the words of one of my more sympathetic correspondents, it has turned out to be an annus horribilis. In that old maxim, moderation in all things. I sometimes wonder how future generations will judge the events of this tumultuous year. I dare say that history will take a slightly more moderate view than that of some contemporary commentators. He who has never failed to reach perfection has a right to be the harshest critic. There can be no doubt, of course, that criticism is good for people and institutions that are part of public life. No institution, city, monarchy, whatever, should expect to be free from the scrutiny of those who give it their loyalty and support, not to mention those who don't. But we are all part of the same fabric of our national society. And that scrutiny by one part of another can be just as effective if it is made with a touch of gentleness, good humor, and understanding. This sort of questioning can also act, and it should do so, as an effective engine for change. I think that the death of Princess Diana was the biggest crisis of the Queen's reign, and probably something that historically she will be judged by. And I think despite the film The Queen and despite The Crown, people still think the Queen handled it badly and didn't seem to understand what the, her subjects were feeling and thinking. But I think the Queen didn't understand because they traditionally, the royal family, when there is a death, and there have been many, many, they mourn quietly amongst themselves. And the Queen thought, because of William and Harry, it would be utter cruelty to expose them to crowds of wailing people and that they must be kept at Balmoral. But it actually was wrong, as it, as it turned out. But she remedied the situation, but I think it will still be seen as probably one of the disasters of her reign. So when the Queen and Philip um, arrived in London from Balmoral, uh, there were crowds and crowds of, of, of people outside Buckingham Palace and flowers, and the Queen was actually very nervous because there was such an atmosphere. I mean, I was there, I remember the atmosphere was sort of, you almost felt that there was gonna be a revolution. But she walked through the crowd and it was sort of, for the moment it was silent. And then uh, a lady handed her some flowers and she said, oh, shall I put them by the gate? She said, no, ma'am, they're for you. And that broke the tension. And she, after that, it was all right. First, I want to pay tribute to Diana myself. She was an exceptional and gifted human being. In good times and bad, she never lost her capacity to smile and laugh, nor to inspire others with her warmth and kindness. I admired and respected her for her energy and commitment to others, and especially for her devotion to her two boys. This week at Balmoral, we have all been trying to help William and Harry come to terms with the devastating loss that they and the rest of us have suffered. No one who knew Diana will ever forget her. Millions of others who never met her but felt they knew her will remember her. I, for one, believe there are lessons to be drawn from her life and from the extraordinary and moving reaction to her death. I'm naturally somewhat biased, but I think our children have done rather well under very different and difficult and demanding circumstances. <clears throat> I think, I hope we can be forgiven for feeling rather proud of them. 
And I'm also encouraged to see what a good start the next generation is making. And we had two. I think that the main lesson that we've learned is that tolerance is the one essential ingredient of any happy marriage. It may not be quite so important when things are going well, but it is absolutely vital when things get difficult. And uh, you can take it from me that the Queen has the quality of tolerance and abundance. <laughs> I think many people have asked the Queen and asked Prince Philip what is the secret of, of their relationship. And the Queen has spoken out on a few occasions. And she said, patience, sense of humor. And she said famously, of course, that Prince Philip had simply been her rock and her stay over the years. And he had, he'd always been there to support her. Although he never involved himself in constitutional affairs, he was there as a sounding board. He was someone to listen and someone who would be on her side or would give her uh, criticism, which of course nobody else really could. Our humble and hearty thanks to all those in Britain and around the world who have welcomed us and sustained us and our family in the good times and the bad so unstintingly over many years. This has given us strength, most recently during the sad days after the tragedy of Diana's death. It is you, if I may now speak to all of you directly, who have seen us through and helped us to make our duty fun. We are deeply grateful to you, each and every one. Yesterday, I listened as Prince Philip spoke at the Guild Hall, and I then proposed our host's health. Today, the roles are reversed. All too often, I fear Prince Philip has had to listen to me speaking. Frequently, we have discussed my intended speech beforehand, and as you will imagine, his views have been expressed in a forthright manner. <laughs> he is someone who doesn't take easily to compliments, but he has quite simply been my strength and stay all these years. And I and his whole family, and this and many other countries, owe him a debt greater than he would ever claim, or we shall ever know. Well, many people have asked Prince Philip how he wants to be remembered, and he says, typically, he says, well, I won't be around, so I don't care, do I? But I think, I hope he'll be remembered for what he's done for conservation and what he's done for the sciences. I think he'll be remembered for his Duke of Edinburgh Award because it bears his name. And I think he will also be remembered for his gaffes, which is a bit of a shame, but I think when people think of Prince Philip, they think of, oh, Philip and the ladies, and Philip and, her, and his politically incorrect remarks. And sometimes those things stick. It is almost impossible to imagine the great burden of responsibility that has been carried by Her Royal Highness Queen Elizabeth II throughout her life. But there is no doubt that the unbreakable bond and closeness that she shares with her husband and the love and support they have afforded one another has carried them together and made the toils of life that much more worthwhile.